I want to welcome you to Prime Time. I'm Angela Shannon. And um, I uh, thank the library for hosting this again, for having the English department here, as well as Nicole Miller. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Nicole. She's our colleague from NICAMS, from New York's uh, Center for Arts and Media Studies. I always have to look at that. I know the acronym, but I forget what it means. So, uh, Nicole's fiction has appeared or is forthcoming in the journals Image, Underwater New York, Alaska Quarterly Review, Nano Fiction, and Two Serious Ladies. <laughs> in 2011, she was the recipient of a postgraduate writing fellowship from the Milton Center and Image Journal. The Milton Fellowship is dedicated to fostering excellence in creative writing by Christians. It aids writers who seek to animate the Christian imagination, promote intellectual integrity, and explore the human condition with honesty and compassion. It's fitting that Nicole would win this postgraduate award. She's a graduate of Bethel University and of Sarah Lawrence College, and she, where she earned her MFA degree. And it's quite a delight to have Nicole here to share her fiction with us. Welcome, Nicole. Um, thanks to you all for, for being here, um, and thank you to Bethel for um, welcoming me here, and um, Barrett Fisher and everyone in your office for um, making it possible for me to be here. Um, I've really enjoyed my time at, at NICAM since September, and um, I'm looking forward to having some of you, I hope, as students in the spring, and perhaps in future semesters. Um, so the story I wanted to, to read today is called All the Ships in the Sky. Um, it's a bit of a long story, so I, I, I kind of wanted to dive in without much preamble. Um, except to say one thing, um, I did want to say one thing as, as a preface, um, which is really um, an apology. I, um, I feel like I need to apologize uh, to the Irish um, <laughs> for what I'm about to do to their lovely brogue. <laughs> I knew John and Iris only briefly and not well, in the way that you know the neighbors who live below you by the slant of their voices through the thin floorboards, by the sound of their feet on the stairs. Irish, John, and Iris. John and Irish, Iris, and the baby. I can't remember now what they called her. Lived on the second floor of the house. I had the third floor, the attic where the ceilings sloped in every room and you had to stoop to wash the dishes. This was in the house in Woodlawn, George's house. He lived on the first floor. They were good neighbors, John and Iris. They kept to themselves mostly, but were friendly when you caught them on the stairs. You had the feeling they were the sort of people you could ask to sit for your animals or plants if you were ever in need of that sort of thing. I heard later that John had left Iris, or she had left him, one or the other. I was sorry to hear it. And of course, I've since got my own wife back. So you see, we've swapped our domestic grief. But they were good neighbors, the two of them. That was a long winter, and I was glad for the company of the little disturbances, scraping chairs, flushing pipes, their voices below me. The thing I remember about John, he wore a tie and drove a pickup truck into the city each day. In the morning, on my way out to read the paper at the Irish coffee shop, I might catch a glimpse of Iris through the open door in her bathrobe, kissing John goodbye. When their door was open, you could just see one wall, where they'd hung an oil reproduction of the Last Supper. The Lord was blessing the meal, and he had on a robe the same shade of blue as the one Iris wore. I remember that John liked to flip his tie over his shoulder when he took out the garbage, his shoes crunching on the walk, Iris and the girl maybe waving in the window while the tailpipe of his truck breathed exhaust in the street. Or I would see them in their clothes for mass, Iris in that green dress, wearing heels, the girl saddled to her hip. I remember her bright lipstick in that dull gray street. I met her on the stairs at various times of the day, taking the girl out in a stroller or going down for the mail. We all got our mail in the same box. She was good to sort my letters out and leave them for me at the top of the stairs. It was mostly statements from the utilities, circulars from the A&P, bulk mail, 
but she was thoughtful to leave it on my step like that. I tried to see my apartment through their eyes, if they visited, for instance. Would I be ashamed by the little galley kitchen tucked under the eaves where I heated my supper? The couch with the green floral print that came with the apartment because nobody seemed to know how to get it out the doorway and down the narrow flight of stairs. But I'm not sure they were ever inside my apartment the whole time I lived there, which wasn't long. I kept odd hours that winter, sometimes falling asleep on the couch in the afternoon and waking in the evening when the street lamps came on. Then I'd work for a few hours at my desk. Or I might wander over to the cemetery at three or four in the afternoon to give my legs a stretch. The paths there were good for walking and I could count on the quiet. The stone walls kept out the sounds of the traffic or muffled them so that what you heard made you think of the river that ran along the parkway and gave it its name. You could almost feel for an hour that you were in another country. In the old sections of the cemetery, anchors marked the graves of sailors. You had German, Dutch, Irish names. You had stones in another language. The newer sections of the cemetery I avoided, and the large mausoleums, Woolworth, Press. I preferred the small plots where the markers were worn so you couldn't read the names, the skeleton key script suggesting other centuries when the S's looked like F's. I remember the dingy light of those afternoons, the low cover of clouds that might have been the season, or smog. There was always the threat of snow. Hunched in my coat, I stayed until dusk when they closed the gates. No one bothered me. I went home and climbed the dark stairwell, my fingers tingling in the inside air. I turned on a lamp and put the kettle on the stove. I heard the radio on or the TV downstairs, Iris listening to the news. In the recliner, with my cup, I strained to catch the voice of the five o'clock anchor, which hardly gave me the sense of a life. That was the winter when the pictures appeared, all over the neighborhood, of the young man who'd gone missing on New Year's Eve. His parents have come over from Ireland, George, my landlord, told me. They've been here three weeks, no sign of them. They left a brand new truck in the parking lot of O'Clarkins. Out walking in the afternoon, my hands in my pockets, snow flurries salting the shoulders of my coat, the young man's face appeared in the windows of the Irish coffee shop and the delis and O'Malley's pub. In the pictures, Xeroxed in black and white, he was smiling and holding a birthday cake. A friend of a friend of Rose's was with him that night, George said. Rose was his daughter. They were all drinking, having a big time, of course. It was a holiday. He shook his head. You just don't think. You don't think you could die in another country, I thought, not so far from home. And some mornings I rose before dawn to sit on my porch, on the roof at the top of the house, in my stocking cap and coat. I listened to the thug thug of the train down the hill, the hiss and squeal of the garbage truck below, the woodpecker and the giant spruce. If I was still, a squirrel might steal up on the porch. You had to be there at just the right time of day to catch the light as it heaved itself over the horizon, glancing at the tangled ridge along the river and the rooftops cloudy with frost. About the time you got too cold to stay out there, the sky had already swallowed the sun. It was snowing when I knocked on George's door. I was holding the long fluorescent tube that I pulled from the ceiling in my apartment. Bulbs out, I said. Come in, come in. You could have called, George said. Rose was in the kitchen. I'm making soup, she said. I laid the light bulb on the coffee table. Are you warm enough up there? George asked. Sure. He picked up a section of the newspaper from the stack on the couch. Did you see this? He said. Thousands protest savage cutbacks. You see? You see? Don't listen to him, said Rose. He's just anxious about the house. I offered to go out and shovel the walk. Not here, back home. They're having record temperatures in Ireland. It's the ice, said George. Everything shut down. There was no money for salt trucks or plows. He was worried about the pipes in the old farmhouse in Lanesboro. You know, last year I stayed there all winter so I could keep the heat going. Couldn't get there this year. Do you want some tea, Nick? Said Rose. I'll have the water going in a minute. Problem, George said. There's no money. Government's broke. Nothing's moving. I'd heard all this before, Ireland's troubles. 
unemployment and some sort of real estate freeze. New homes foreclosed, sitting vacant in their, sh in their lots like cruise ships in dry dock. The whole country was gummed up. Power lines sealed in a sleeve of ice, roads buried six inches down, no trash pickup, no mail service, fleets of government vehicles stalled in rows. Can't be that bad. I was pulling George's leg. Did you hear about the young man? said Rose. Parents have gone back to Ireland, George said. Still no sign of the boy. The boy. He couldn't have been much younger than me at the time. He was one of the ones that came over with friends, living six in a flat, to work for cash laying carpet, sealing drains, probably making more money than I was. My friend Carly's girlfriend from college was there that night. Nobody saw anything. It's a shame. Something about those posters hanging in the dark windows on Katona Avenue. The bakeries closed, the pubs sitting empty with the air getting colder and the guttering dirty drifts. I don't know, George said. What's it all about? We had 13 inches of snow in as many hours, according to George. The children's corral at St. Barnabas was canceled. Bus service was delayed. The trains were still running. I felt the tremor every half hour at the top of the house rattling the kitchen faucet. I opened my sliding glass door and shoveled snow from the porch, dumping it over the railing. It made a soft puff when it hit the yard. I dug stiff brown leaves from the drain spout. I couldn't sleep at night because my feet were cold. The power went out one evening, ice on the lines, and around about eight there was a knock on the door. It was John with a flashlight. You all right up here? I am, I said. Space heater's gone out, but I'm all right for batteries and that sort of thing. Iris says you're to come down. We'll open the bottle. I followed him with his flashlight down a flight of stairs. Come in, come in, Iris said from the kitchen. I'd never been inside their apartment before. The candles on the table launched shadows over the floorboards and up the walls where scenes from the Gospels hung. I remember the Lord's Prayer, stenciled in gold. Iris entered the living room with three glasses and handed John a bottle of red to open. In the darkness, she poured generously, and I liked the feel of the wine as it flushed down my throat. I said to John, I bet he doesn't keep any candles up there. Bachelors never think of those things. Thanks, I said, grateful to you. Sit, sit, she said. I don't mind a blackout now and then. You feel like you're camping. To keep warm enough up there, I usually wear two pairs of socks. I, she said, he's not too liberal, is he, with the heat? Excuse me a moment, I'm just going to look at the baby. How quiet it suddenly seemed in the dark. It was the appliances, I thought. The grid powered down. I sat next to John on the couch. Their apartment was bigger than mine, on account of the eaves, I guessed. I tried to place my recliner in relation to this room. What is it you do then? said John. It's a good question, I said. I wonder that myself. What about you? I do books. I gathered he meant accounts. I said, I do books myself. You don't hear the baby crying up there, do you? Said Iris, coming back into the room. She gets fussy sometimes. I thought briefly of the parties I'd heard. Not actual parties, just the kind of parties where your best friend or your sister comes over on a Saturday morning, and you play music, and you dance around the living room in your pajamas. The baby seemed to like that. I could often hear her laughing. How could I tell Iris that their domestic sounds entered my home like the smell of someone else's bacon frying and gave me a very fond feeling? That the sight of the little girl's head on John's shoulders as he carried her up the stairs, that light skull cap of hair, placed a pressure on my chest that I didn't mind, could have lived with all my life. As, in fact, I have. No, no, I said, not a peep. There was a knock on the door and it was George with a flashlight. Hold blocks out, he said. Come in, Iris said. John, get another glass. The two of them were as merry as hosts on a holiday, and one of them brought out a plate of cheese with a little ham, and Iris said, we may as well eat it before it goes bad. Where'd you get this? George had some of the ham. My sister was just over to Ireland, brought it back, Iris said. I was going to say, I haven't found a place to get it around here. No, no, she said, that's Irish ham. I'll tell you a story, George said, about my great-grandparents. This was during the famine. A lot of people died in those years. 
and my great-granddad left the family to go look for work. His wife with four kids at home. That winter they were so hungry they were boiling leather for soup. Can you imagine? Iris said. You can't, you can't, George said. And great-granddad, he was gone for months. He came home in the spring with no money and no food, hardly any meat on his hide. Wife took one look at him when he came up the walk, and she turned around and went back inside the house. Didn't recognize him. The way she told it later, she was so mad at him for leaving, she didn't want anything to do with him. I said, my wife would have done the same thing. And granddad, when he told the story, always said it was only that he couldn't stand to see them all suffer while he left. There was no work anyway for anyone, but he couldn't stand to see them starve, and he wasn't going to take food from their mouths. Well, they came back because he hadn't died yet, and he thought he'd see about plant in the back 40. Those were hard times, John said. Nick, Iris said, I didn't know you were married. They were all looking at me. Well, she's not here, is she? Iris said. No, I said, but I hope she will be soon. I was going to say, I don't think I've ever seen a woman enter or leave that apartment. She laughed and looked at John. Lots of couples we know have got separated, where one of them stays and the other one comes over for work. It's a hard life, she said. It is, I said. Iris peered back at me. Is she back home then? Iris, John said, leave him be. Home. I couldn't say where that was. Yes, my wife was back home, across the bridge, in another state, in another country. I listened to them talk late into the night. When Iris began to yawn, I set down my glass. Thanks so much for the hospitality. You'll excuse me, I have an early morning. I'm sorry to grill you, she said at the door. I don't mean anything by it, you know. You're all right, Iris, I said. Come down any time. We like the company. The baby was sick, I thought. She'd been crying all night. Her voice sounded stark and raw. I lay in the dark staring at the gray ceiling. Light from the street reached me through the slats and the blinds so that the objects in the room looked both familiar and strange. I thought I could hear John and Iris downstairs speaking in low, weary tones, discussing whether or not to call the doctor, the baby having puked up the cough syrup on Iris's shoulder. At least, this was what I imagined they were saying. The baby also sounded weary. Having spent all evening voicing her need, her rage had turned rote and hoarse. I could have got up and turned on the light, found the paperback on my nightstand, but it was too much trouble to move. We thought we were, once, my wife and I, going to have a baby. We thought we were for a couple of weeks. She took the test. She cried when she called her parents, who said, great news. But it wasn't, and we didn't think so at first. We never got quite settled with money. I couldn't find work, and she, my wife, hated the restaurant. And there was no room in the apartment for a crib. And then, gradually, I started thinking of all the things I would tell a son, or a daughter, either way. I would explain the difference between a curveball and a slider, how to grip the ball and how to release it. I would tell him that we were Mets fans, no matter what his or her granddad said. I would tell him that his mother, when we were first married, used to wake before me on a Saturday morning to roll out biscuits on the counter. It may have been only that once, but it doesn't matter. When I remember her now, I think of the woman with that kind of devotion, rising early to wait on baking powder and salt. I would tell him that on the night Floyd Mayweather fought Ricky Hatton, that first three minutes when Hatton came out swinging, I thought at the time that Hatton had it. And when Roy Jones Jr. fought Joe Calzaghe and sent him to his knees in the first round, I thought, that's it, it's over. But then Jones got tired and that windbag Calzaghe took the fight by unanimous decision, the moral being that it's not how you start a thing that matters, but how you finish it. This seemed like what a father should say. But a few weeks into it, into our thinking about things like this, what to tell the kid when it was older and how we might finance its college education, she came out of the bathroom and said she'd been spotting. She thought she'd just flushed our child down the toilet, and the next time she took the test, she wasn't. We weren't anymore. And she was sad for a very long time. And she was fired from her job, or at least they told her to take some time off. 
I thought she might feel better if she talked to someone, but she didn't want to talk to someone. On the couch, covered in the green floral print chosen by someone else, hauled by someone else up that narrow flight of stairs, I dreamed until the light from the street lamp woke me. Downstairs, the baby was silent. I couldn't tell what time it was, but I knew it had snowed because of how quiet the room was and how bright. Lying there in the false morning of the street lamp, I wondered how I'd remember it all. Her face, which I could always ply like clay, prodding it into the mask of a goldfish, a clown. I wanted to remember her earlobes, soft as calf skin, the way her eyelashes brushed my cheek like the pale wings of a moth, the way her wrists looked when she broke an egg in the bowl, how I wanted to reach for them and lift them to my lips, how she paddled the sheet with her foot when she slept, the smell of her scalp, the crush of her legs, the sturdy raft of her ribs. How would I remember all there was to remember when there was all that and more, the vase of her neck, her blunt hands, the sweater she left on the back of the chair, the socks she left on the floor, I wanted to lift her hair, undress her face, let it pool on the pillow like daylight. I had to remember that I loved her, lying on a stranger's couch. Late in February during that bleak winter, the snow flurries coming nearly every day, and the wind that rocked the pines and tore at the sheets of plastic on the windows, news came that there was a lead on the young man who'd gone missing. George told me this at his kitchen table. The Conoco station had run a charge for gas on a credit card belonging to the young man. The Conoco station was in Memphis, Tennessee. George slapped his leg. You see, he said, your sins will find you out. And I wasn't sure whose sins he was referring to, the young man's or someone else's. That's generally true, I said. Do they have any idea who charged the card? Not yet, not yet, they've got an APB out. The parents are coming from Ireland. I didn't ask how he knew this. In this neighborhood, there was always some Irish game of telephone in play. The parents were coming from Ireland. For some reason, this made me sad. The eagerness, the hope in the errand, when it must have been clear to anyone involved in the case that the young man was dead. I said, I hope they find him. Not yet, not yet, they haven't found him yet. When John and Iris heard that I didn't have a TV, they brought up a little set with a pair of rabbit ears. It's just been sitting in the closet, Iris said. The reception's not great, but you could at least know what's going on in the world. I'd hate to put George out of a job, I said. <laughs> well, you'd be doing us a favor, clearing out our closet. No remote, though. You'll have to stand up and turn the knob. That's good, I said. I'll get my exercise. Just set it down there, I told John. <coughs> Late at night, when I couldn't sleep, I found fuzzy westerns on the tube. The outlawed Josie Wales, John Ford's The Searchers. They reminded me of something my wife once said. She put down the book she was reading, I don't remember which one, and worked her bare feet down under my legs. She said, nothing happens in books anymore. People just sit around and think. Sometimes they talk, I said. <laughs> Louis L'Amour, my wife said, my dad had a whole bookshelf of Louis L'Amour. What's Louis L'Amour, I said. He wrote paperback westerns. They were set in small type. Somebody always got shot by the end, she said. I should get my hands on dad's Louis L'Amour. I need something with a real plot. I thought about this late at night in front of John and Iris's TV, how my wife had wanted a plot. After we lost the baby, we didn't fight. I wouldn't have minded if we did, but my wife didn't seem to care about plot anymore. And I couldn't find her, wherever she was, across the bridge and in that other nightly country. I walked to the cemetery almost every day, even with the snow piled on the path. Gustav Auer, 1879 to 1925. Solomon Chevougie, in 1852 to 1917. Aunt Hep, May 14. They leave the old country on a ship called the Jubilee with their three small children and two heavy trunks. They make the Atlantic crossing in eight weeks under stars which burn like the ships in the harbor behind them. When they arrive in New York, there is no hero's welcome, no ticker tape, no marching band, only the oily wharves, the algae, the stench, 
the thick-armed men slinging cargo and calling like carnival barkers. In America, they can't read the signs. At night, having landed on the shores of their dreams, their sleep is troubled and brief. They wake with the fear they might never dream again. But they build fences here and plant pear trees in the yard. They read the local paper and listen to baseball games. They join neighbors now and then on the stoop. They grow old here, their glasses sliding down their nose, their hands in their lap like two brown birds. They are buried here in the Woodlawn Cemetery among strangers with the sound of rush hour on the parkway down the hill. Stubbings, Bankfit, Stump. John and Iris moved back to Ireland that spring. She wanted to be near her mother. I was sorry to see them go. I watched the big truck pull up to the house and movers begin to empty their apartment of tables, chairs, mattresses, mirrors. I was gone when the truck finally pulled away. George was the one who told me about their split. By then he wasn't my landlord anymore, but I'd still drop by for shortbread and tea. I wondered if they'd found Ireland as they'd hoped, or if it flattened them with its troubles, which they'd mostly forgotten. As far as I know, they never did find the young man who was missing. The parents came from Ireland. The parents returned to Ireland. Nobody knew what happened that night, though it was pretty clear he'd got in with the wrong crowd. Maybe there had been a fight in the parking lot of O'Clarican's, and everyone there too drunk to stop it and too scared later to say what happened. Or maybe they were happy drunks, turning up the street after last call. It was nearly four in the morning. New Year's Day and getting colder. Imagine the new day, the new year, spreading like a continent on the horizon, something you feel as a pressure in the blackness before you see it, rising all at once over the prow at first light, water streaming from its sides. And he, the young man, his head buoyed by Jameson's, breaks away from the group to take a piss in the ophthalmologist's doorway. And he's leaning against the side of the building, his arms and feet and the dick in his hands all of a piece, all sharing in the same dreamy feeling of booze and fatigue and the relief of his bladder as it empties against the bricks. He doesn't notice the cold anymore. And maybe he's singing under his breath, the bells of Ireland. Because he's only been in this country for two weeks and he fucking hates it. But not tonight, not with the others just down the street. They're singing too and not with the new year before them like a sleeping animal, waiting for them to wake it with their plans and the small, naughty muscles in their arms. And he shakes it out and tucks it in and moves from the doorway to catch up with his mates, but they're far down the street now and he's in no hurry. He's got the whole new year to catch up. Nobody sees him reel down the street, alone, turning where the pavement leads. Nobody sees and no one misses him either, most of them he only met last night. Nobody sees him lurch through the intersection at the corner of Webster and East 233rd, the traffic lights red like the beady headlights of a cruiser. Nobody knows when or how he finds his way over the guardrail and down the snowy slope, darkened by trees and thick brush, which might have halted his progress down, down to the bottom of the Bronx River. You don't think the thing that kills you will be that little wasted creek inaudible along the parkway, clogged with limbs and just beginning to grow a skin of ice. You could almost imagine, in the waking darkness, that the young man wasn't really missing after all. Not the way they all thought. He might have been living a few blocks over on Married Avenue, among the water nymphs and the panhandlers and the gypsy cabs parked outside the subway station. Maybe he wasn't what they expected anymore his parents, his friends, the hair not quite right, the part on the other side. That mole wasn't there before, was it? Maybe they just didn't recognize him. The place changes you. You're given a different name when you step off the ship. You say your prayers now in a different tongue. Or you come upon your wife on a spring afternoon, standing in the lane with an onion in her hand, empty-handed, hatless, you move toward the house with your broken teeth and your ditch digger eyes. You're after platting that back 40. In the lane, the bees are buzzing. The rhododendrons shade the path. 
The children are inside, and your wife, in a pale print dress, seeing the stranger in the lane, turns back toward the house. That's it. that completely give me a picture of, of that person or that place. Do you collect a whole bunch of details and then pick out a couple to put in the story? Or do you, as you're imagining the story, do those details just come to you? Can you talk about how that happens a little bit? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure I have a good answer. Um, well, I, I spend a lot of time um, walking. And, um, and that story, you know, parts of it really um, came from my own walking in that neighborhood um, in Woodlawn, um, walking in that cemetery, and, um, and it was a cold winter. And, um, and yeah, you know, I carry a notebook, um, I think all writers do, and um, try to notice the world. Um, and um, I don't know, what, what is it that Henry James says, that a writer is someone on whom nothing is lost? Um, so I mean, yeah, I, I, I try to I try to pay attention, um, but but I don't I don't know how that gets translated into the story, um, except that um, you know you try to enter that 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 world and um, and record it faithfully. I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good question, Susan. <laughs> yeah. I kind of have a question about details, too. Um, one thing I noticed was some of the characters more on the periphery, like the baby or um, the wife or the young man, uh, were nameless. And I was just wondering if there's like a decision-making process that goes into that creatively, or you know, if you just start writing and you, you don't have names, and then they just end up being the young man or the baby, or? Well, that's, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I think that the narrator is speaking from a, a position of, of retrospect. I mean, he's looking back on an earlier time in his life. So um, it, it would make sense to me that he doesn't remember the name of the baby. They were neighbors. He only lived there for a couple of months. And so, um, and also, I, I, maybe it's possible, and, and I may be making this up, but, um, you know, I think in some ways that the baby is the site of a certain kind of longing in the narrator for family, for, for paternity. Um, and, and his wife. Um, and so um, I, I suppose by making the baby nameless, m maybe the, the baby becomes a kind of bigger, more universal kind of, um, kind of character. Um, as far as the young man, I didn't give the young man a name, um, in part because he, he's, he's one of the, the nameless crowd that, that come um, sometimes with papers, sometimes not. And, they, um, and as I said in the story, they, they they are living under the table in some in some ways, and when they go missing, they're they're anonymous still, and um, um, and that seems to me quite um, tragic. Um, so uh, I don't know. It, it, does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank yeah. You. Joey and I were just briefly discussing how writing can be excruciating. <laughs> <laughs> can you um, can yeah. you explain? I guess you're writing process and like your kind of day-to-day -day writing process yeah. and also do you enjoy writing <laughs> or if it is suffering how is it <laughs> suffering? That's a good question for us. Um, yes. <laughs> um, I, so my, my process um, usually doesn't look like doing very much at all. Um, nothing happens in my pajamas on the couch. Um, and I, I so so I, I suppose I am at my best in the mornings um, before I'm fully awake. Angela and I were talking about this last night. Um, it is terrifying to approach the, the blank page, right? So you have to kind of do it when you can kind of um, trick your editor, right, into being quiet. Um, so that often happens when I'm not fully awake um, with a cup of coffee, and um, or late at night, you know, again, where I'm kind of um, I'm a, a little duller, it, you know, and I can be a little bit more open to um, you know, the imaginative world. Um, do I enjoy it? Yes, but it's also, um, 
I mean, it's the thing I do when I'm sad, bored, or lonely. I mean, I think that this is something that, um, maybe a, a myth that you have to sit down and write when you feel like a writer, when you feel ready to create something wonderful. Um, no, it's really um, a kind of shabby kind of um, vocation. And um, um, I don't know, it's a kind of anecdote, or antidote, I think, to the, the sad, bored, and lonely. So I don't know. What's your experience with that, your writer? <laughs> Uh, I guess I kind of treat it like a job, I suppose. But yeah, I, by being regular I, about I it, I probably feel pretty guilty about not having any word count, not not yeah. having any production at all. You know. Yeah. And so I there's a lot of like you know psychological neur neur neurosis. Yeah. That I probably suffer. Yeah, I used to. Un 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 yeah, I felt that too. Like I, I always have um, something, something shifted for me where it's not a thing of guilt anymore, and I don't know why. I don't know what, like, how that happened, but I think it's. Um, but I think getting around the guilt. I think that you're all writers in the room. Many of you, do you all have that sense of guilt? Like I should be writing. I should be writing, and you spend more time thinking about writing than actually doing it. Does anybody have like? What? Do you, how do you get around that? You write it down. You write about how guilty you feel. That's true, actually. That's that's a really great entry point to it. By by doing pre-writing, that actually leads you into the the writing. Yeah, I think that's great. Yeah. Or I just write the crappiest stuff that I can think of. Like I feel really tired, and I wish I wouldn't have eaten that bowl of ice cream last night. And I don't want to be here. And you know, and and then you kind of you trick your way into writing other stuff. So. Nicole, how did you choose your narrator? Why that particular point of view? And I also wonder if you try different points of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, that story um, started about six or seven years ago. Um, I was living in Toronto, and I met, um, I was right after I graduated from Bethel, actually. I lived in Toronto for two years, and um, I met a, a gentleman named Claire. And um, Claire was this lovely um, man. He was in his 60s. He had this beautiful white hair, and he wore these impeccable suits. And he was very—he um, was a gentleman. And he was um, the manager of this very high-end furniture boutique. And I was just—he was a dear friend. And and he had this picture uh, of his parents um, taken in the Netherlands um, the day after his father got home from a concentration camp. This was after the war, and. Um, and I saw that picture, and it, it was so striking to me that that moment of reunion um, captured in the visual frame. And I was so intrigued, and I, I wanted to sort of think about that moment, right? Because there are so many um, kind of conflicting emotions in that moment of return. And I sort of suspected that return, reunion, um, isn't necessarily what you think it always might be. Um, so I started writing about it, and I started writing about Claire, and I was, you know, 22, 23, I didn't know anything, and it was really hard, you know, how could I write about this, um, you know, 60-year-old man whose parents emigrated from, from the Netherlands, Dutch reformed, he was gay, he had a totally different kind of um, lifescape than I, than I had, and um, so for all of those reasons, um, the story didn't amount to much, <laughs> um, and so, you know, it, it wasn't quite, I didn't have the skills to, to make it what I, I wanted it to be, and so it sat in a drawer for a few years, and other things happened, and um, I wrote other stories, and, and many of them sat in, in a drawer. And um, about a year ago, I, uh, the, the voice of this narrator um, sort of suggested itself to me, um, and I felt like I could I could trust that voice, and um, I felt like that voice could kind of be a container for um, that image of the couple back in the old country um, finding each other again, and. Um, and for, uh, that it could kind of draw together the threads of a few different stories that I had worked on and that could kind of amounted to nothing. So um, I think w one of the reasons why I could kind of follow that voice um, was in part because I had some distance personally from that voice. It's male. Um, but also, you know, it, I, there were enough similarities um, between my own experience and, and that guy's that I could... Um, I could kind of, I felt like I could establish some kind of balance there. So, um, 
I don't know. I don't know if it works, but um, if, if those different threads do do work, I think it's because um, I, I could trust that voice. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Um, your, your narrator's wife remark makes the remark about nothing happening in the books except for thinking and talking. Yeah. Nothing happens in the sto right. story except right. for thinking and talking. Yeah. Yeah. What um, when you what role does um, action, plot, etc., not uh, play in, in your writing, in this story, or, or when you're thinking about it? Right? None. None. I don't. I don't know how to make things happen in a story. I know how to make sentences happen, and so that's really the best I can do. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's true. I, that's that's a weakness I think in my work. Um, there are there aren't grand plots. Um, I think I'm I'm interested in that condition of stillness often, and I find myself. I mean, and that can unfortunately sometimes turn into stasis. I mean, that's that's a problem. You don't want stasis on the page. But I I, um, I suppose what I what I can do is make the sentences achieve enough of their own energy and momentum so that you don't notice <laughs> that nothing's happening. I don't I don't know. <laughs> um, that's that's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you're not working with, with action, you know, if things happen, then they're done happening uh, yeah. at a certain point. How do you know when the story is done? <laughs> and that's a question I, that I experience writing and the question I get from students a lot. How do I know when this is finished, yeah. when I'm at the end? I suppose, like, one way that an ending might be satisfying is if it cast back in some way on um, your earlier assumptions as a reader, or if it transforms an early image in some way. Um, so for example, in this story, and I don't know if it's a satisfying ending, but I, what I tried to do is, is have that the, the moment at the end of this story where, where he's talking about his the, the wife, the stranger in the lane with the onion in her hand. I mean, it's a kind of transformation of George's story that my great grandparents had this, and so suddenly that's the the narrator personalizes that moment. Um, so that early image is, is transformed in some way. Um, but I don't I don't know. I think it's a really intuitive kind of thing. Um, so I think sometimes if you feel like the story isn't working or the ending isn't working, maybe you've either ended it <coughs> too early, or you've you, you need to actually cut off the last paragraph. You've, you've, um, you've ended it too late. Um, and sometimes there's a really satisfying ending, like a paragraph earlier. Um, but I like a story to end with some ambiguity. I don't like you know um, things to feel tied up neatly. Um, that's maybe a matter of my own taste. But um, yeah, I don't know. Any, any of the rest of you have thoughts about endings? What makes a good ending? Any ending is a good ending. If I'm writing it. <laughs> 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 if you just barrel through to the end. <laughs> yeah, I get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell me one more question. So. And we can also chat more informally. I think there it looks like there's some coffee and. and back there. So, um, thank you all. Oh, yeah, Barrett. I, I, I asked a question about reading. Yeah. Yeah, who do you keep reading? I just, um, I just finished uh, Christine Scott's new novel, Prosperous Friends. Um, do you all know Christine Scott? Uh, she's, she's the, the best for my money. She's, she's it. She's, um, she's a short fiction writer and, and, and novelist, um, and her sentences have so much, uh, restraint in them. Um, there's just a real taut precision in her lines um, that I just admire. And, um, and there's something akin to poetry. So I go back to that, I, to her again and again. Um, her and her, her pal Diane Williams also, who's writing short fiction. Um, I think those are two necessary writers. Um, Gary Lutz is also in that bag of people. Um, who um, I admire very much. Um, I have to say, I'm not as interested in the, you know, the contemporary novels right now. I'd rather read a good biography right now. I'm just bored with the contemporary novel. I don't know. Um, who's doing interesting work? Anybody, like, what do, you, what, do you, what do you recommend? Give me some recommendations. <laughs> um, I 
Yeah, that's it. That's it, right? That's it. Yeah, I think so too because um, those are poets are the well of language, and the pages. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody for, for being here. I'm really grateful. Thank you.